Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. And he can be your wonderful Savior tonight. And for those of you who have trusted Jesus Christ, you're in the family of God, you have a Savior forever and forever and forever. Uh, King Charles, at his ordination, at, at uh, his coronation, there was somebody who would inevitably stand up and say, long live the king. Well, in case of God, that long is not long enough. His reign will endure forever and forever and forever. And that's the king of whom we sing tonight. I want to encourage you with a couple of different things. Our table will be available directly after the service. And there, I do want you to pick up one of our prayer cards uh, this is our first time to be at Capital City Baptist Church, but we want the ministry that uh, we've had this week to continue. So take a prayer card, uh, pray for us by name, and then visit by way of QR code, a way that you can stream our music. We are high-tech redneck. You, it, anywhere where you stream, our music is available. Alexa, play the Andrew Johnson family. Also, at the back is an illustrated gospel track, Share the Gospel with Somebody. Um, who are the type of people that pass out tracks? The type of people that carry tracks. So why don't you carry a track with you? Get loaded up, get full of ammunition uh, before you leave. Our two recordings. Oh, what a savior! Our very first one that includes the song that we just sang, and our newest one that includes a song that Hannah wrote are both available. Uh, those are both twenty dollars each, and that just keeps us on the road. Um, God is faithful to keep us going on the road through the prayer and support of God's people. So we can take cash, credit, uh, check, Zelle, Venmo, cash app, or your left shoe, whatever you want uh, as payment. We just want to get the music out there because we want to magnify the Lord in our minds. I want to read this. I'm going to give this to Pastor. Um, he usually, I'm sure, would read this card, but I'm not sure if he'd read this in front of everybody, so I'm going to go ahead and read my thank you note right now. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Greetings, Pastor and Mrs. Dalkey and Capital City Baptists. What a wonderful week we've enjoyed together. It was our honor to serve Christ singing and preaching the book. We remain amazed at the detailed preparation and the spirit of unity through BBS and each of the meals. Our kids loved it. Thank you for praying, working, and inviting. We look forward to the next time. Hint, hint. Sincerely, the Andrew Johnson family. So I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. Thank you so much, Pastor, for having us. God bless you. Amen. We are Looking forward to tonight, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. It's in the New Testament. It's the third Gospel. It's the third book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark. Look at Mark chapter 8, if you will. And here's my challenge at the very beginning. Uh, here's your invitation right now. You're invited, you're invited to say yes to the Word of God. Will you say yes to the Word of God as it's read, as it's proclaimed, as it's preached? This isn't just an exercise in futility. As the Word of God is going out, will you say yes to it? There's truth always demands a verdict. You can say yes to it, or you can continue living the way you're living and believing a lie. Truth demands a verdict. You must receive that truth tonight. So will you say yes? Number two, this is my second hope. Uh, right here at the front, at this first step we're going to call an altar, is a little card that simply says evangelism, prayer, commitment. And here's the commitment. I want to be a laborer in the Lord's harvest by praying for these three people. And it could be up to three. It could be more than three. It could be fewer than three. But I want you to consider right now, who needs to hear the gospel one more time in your life? Maybe you've responded to the gospel, but think in your mind, maybe a friend, a family member, or coworker that needs to hear the gospel one more time. And I'm going to challenge you to come right to the front, grab a pen and one of these cards, and fill it out, and then take time to pray tonight. Once you're done, I want you to put it right in this plate, right here. And then over time, you will always have time, that you'll always have something to pray about 
right here at the altar. Uh, you can pray for your friends. There was a story of a man who visited a church after somebody had filled out one of these cards. He didn't know that his name was on one of these cards, but uh, a co-worker had been inviting him to church, and he finally showed up. And uh, he said, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I don't really believe in all that religion stuff. But then he came back the next week, and he heard the gospel one more time. And he came back the next week, and then he brought his family with him. And then he got involved in some of the outreaches there. And three months later, he went right to the front, and he uh, received Jesus Christ as his Savior as he was kneeling down, because the pastor had already been preaching how he could received the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did it right there by himself. And then he went back to his seat. The next week, he came right to the front, grabbed from the plate a random name, and it happened to be the card with his name on it. He was kind of shocked. And then he took that card to the pastor after the service. He said, uh, Pastor, I've already done what you've asked me to do by putting my faith in Jesus Christ, um, so... I don't need my name on this list anymore. Uh, what do you think I should do? Well, the pastor was kind of shocked. Oh, you mean you have trusted Jesus Christ? Yeah, I just did what you told me Jesus commanded me to do by putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. I believe it. Okay, amazing. Well, I guess what you do is cross your name off and put another name on there. And that's what he did. He put his children's name on there. And the week we were there, his son received Jesus Christ. Do you believe that the Lord, uh, do you believe that the Lord can save sinners? Do you believe that you can pray for it? There's a prayer request that Jesus has. Is, it's for laborers to enter into his harvest. There's a field that's ready to be received. Why don't you think right now and ask the Lord in prayer right now who you can put on one of these cards and then pray from here on out. I hope you would take the time before the night's out to fill out one of these cards as well. You're in Mark chapter Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 34. Let me set the context. Let's take a trip back in time. Are you ready to go back in time? Imagine you're living in A.D. 60, you're sitting in a small home. There's 15 to 20 other people there, and you're with people that call themselves Christians. However, you are not a Christian. And you're there because a man named Simon Peter is sharing his first-hand account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So Peter started his story about an hour ago with these words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You're immediately skeptical as this old fisherman continued his story. But then you, you found yourself giving consideration to his claims. You thought if, a, if God really did become man, it's hard to imagine anyone having more amazing words and works than the words and works of this man, Jesus. You heard stories of miracles, demons dispelled, storms stilled by a word, and multitudes fed with just a few fish and a few loaves. You thought, this is the kind of God and Savior I could find myself believing in. Toward the, end of the toward the end of the talk, you cheered with Peter when he passed his final exam. He was asked by Jesus, whom do you say that I am? And he answered, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then, then things took a very strange Turn, as Jesus told Peter and his disciples that he would suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes. And he'd be killed. And after three days, he would rise again. And Peter's response seemed appropriate to you. He rebuked Jesus. After all, Jesus, you're king, not a criminal. You deserve a throne and not a cross. You watch his shame comes across Peter's face as he's told that Christ has rebuked him. Get thee behind me, Satan. You do not savor the things of God, but the things of man. And then Peter paused for quite a while as tear, tears poured from his eyes. He said, I think this is a good time to take a 15-minute break. 
We'll come back together and finish the second half of the story. The people were milling about, getting drinks of water. Some were fellowshipping, but you didn't move. You couldn't get away from this thought. This story has taken a vastly different turn than you thought. Every other king sends followers to die for that king. But this king was about to die for his followers. Jesus would be a very different kind of king than you first believed him to be. Well, 15 minutes have passed. Peter sits down again to begin the story. And you'll notice in the corner there's somebody with a quill and parchment whose name is John Mark. And that brings us to Caesarea Philippi to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And here are these words. If you're there, say, Amen. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Tonight, with the Holy Spirit's help, I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, The Terms and Conditions of Following Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we need your power, we need your help, and Lord, we're about to see one of the greatest commitments that any person could ever make on the planet. We're about to take a step that few have taken, but Lord, you've empowered that step. Lord, we ask that you would be with each and every hearer today, and Lord, help us not to be a hard-hearted hearer. Help us to say yes to you, and help us to do what you want us to do by taking this step. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I've got a sin to confess right now. There have been many times that I've been asked, did you read the terms and conditions? And there's been a check mark box. And I've clicked the box and I've said, accept. And I haven't really read the terms and conditions. Is there anybody in this room that will confess that sin along with me? Okay. Who wants to read 35 pages of legal jargon? No, not me. No thanks. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not sure that that's wise because I'm giving away the most personal information and all of my rights away to the most nefarious companies on the planet. In our passage, we have a message from the Lord that pops up on the screen of our life, if you will. Do you see it? There's a message that's popping up right now, and it gives us the terms and conditions to follow Jesus Christ. You want to follow him? Here's the command. In fact, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, he comes to his earliest disciples and he says two words, follow me. And they left their nets. First of all, what kind of a commitment was it to follow him? Who were they following? What kind of Jesus is it where he can just say, follow me? And fishermen of hard hearts, of various backgrounds and experiences would leave their nets and livelihood and follow Jesus Christ. What kind of man was he? You're invited to do that same thing. There's a pop-up screen of your life. I have good news about these terms and conditions. They haven't been expanded, updated, edited, or revised in the last 2,000 years. And by the way, they never will be. I'm glad to say that these terms and conditions are just 17 words in verse 34. I would warn you, however, these terms and conditions are not trivial and can't be dismissed as an annoyance. They are not to be scrolled through hurriedly or flippantly. If you would miss hell and gain heaven, you must click accept. If you click agree, it'll cost everything. Could I make it crystal clear what this passage is not saying? Please don't miss this. It isn't saying in verse 34, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me to become a Christian. I'm glad that we're saved, as Scripture says, by grace through faith alone. You don't do anything to earn your salvation. Thank God, Jesus paid it all. 
And all we do is cast ourselves upon the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask right there in our sinful condition for his mercy. And he forgives us of not just one sin, but of all our sins. We become a child of God, and then we have the guarantee of heaven for then on. We are a child of the king, and we are a citizen of heaven. And if you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, to come into your life and save you, he's guaranteed to. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to wonder, hope, or wish. If you call upon the name of the Lord and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. To be very clear, every person that is a born-again believer is a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 27 tells us that same thing. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. To call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, to know that you've been truly born again, as an evidence of that, you'll deny yourself. You'll take up your cross, and you'll follow me. This is very serious. If you do not do this, you will lose your soul. The person that doesn't pick up their cross, deny themselves and follow Jesus, doesn't lose their salvation. It just proves that you never had it in the first place. I don't think that there's a passage that's more important to the 21st century Christian American idea of what Christianity is than the passage that we're studying tonight. It reveals the very high cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ and the greater cost of not following him. These words that Jesus speaks here strike at the heart of cool, casual, comfortable Christianity. The idea that becoming a Christian is as simple as praying a prayer, tossing a few dollars into the offering plate, and making a few very minor adjustments in your life, and calling that Christianity is the opposite of what Jesus has died for you to have. One author said it this way, I'm convinced that many modern people have turned their backs on Christianity, not because they've examined Christ and found him true, but they've examined Christians and found them trivial. The unsaved look at the Christianity that's in vogue right here in Ohio. And you say, wait a minute, you're a Christian, but it hasn't changed who you sleep with? It hasn't changed your business practices? It hasn't changed the way you lie or cheat or steal? Why in the world would I have to change anything? Why in the world would I have to follow Jesus Christ if it hasn't changed your life at all? It makes so little of an impact that I'm not sure I need it in the first place. What our passage reveals that this kind of Christianity is as distasteful to Jesus as it is to any of the unsaved world. Ask yourself tonight, According to Jesus, are you a follower of him? What should I expect as I do? Should anyone follow Jesus Christ? And these are the questions that Jesus answers. So notice, number one, the conditions of following Christ. If you met the conditions to follow Christ, look at verse 34. And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said to them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So he was talking to his disciples earlier. Now he's talking to everybody. I love the word whosoever. Whenever I see the Bible say whosoever, I get to put my name right there. Uh, He's calling the multitudes. Whosoever will come after me. That's a wonderful invitation that echoes other invitations all throughout Scripture. You want to see some more whosoever's? Here's John 3, 16. For whosoever, excuse me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's another whosoever. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's the last invitation of Scripture. You can turn all the way to the back of your Bible, and here's another invitation in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The two groups are mentioned. The Spirit, that's God himself going out into the world, convincing and convicting men of their sin, and the bride, 
That's you and me. These are the believers. Here's what the verse says. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You're invited tonight to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a personal invitation from him. You can, you should, and you must follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a universal invitation, but it's also personal to you tonight. It can only be accepted by those that accept the conditions. Only accepted by those who will take up their cross and follow him. You've heard this passage preached before, I'm sure. Let's consider what the word cross really means. Uh, we study scripture and the 24th century idea in a, in a worldview that we see through our glasses of modern, of modern 21st century worldview. Uh, I want us to divorce ourselves from the 21st century worldview tonight, and I want to consider what that word cross truly means, or what it meant to the people hearing Jesus say these words. We have unfortunate mental associations with the cross. We see it as a religious symbol. I've got one right here on this ring. It's a fashion choice sometimes. Sometimes it's sentimental. We decorate with it. The people that heard Jesus speak of a cross did not have these associations. They would have thought about the solely and exclusively cruel way of executing a human being. This wasn't any kind of execution. There's only one word that could describe it. It literally means out of the cross, excruciating. Taking up your cross is not saying, I'm going to wear a cross necklace the next time I play baseball. It's not saying, I'm going to nail a cross on the outside of my bedroom. It, what Jesus is really saying is, if you're going to follow me, you must follow me anywhere, even to death. Sometimes well, we say something trivial like, well, um, last week I had a hangnail in one of my toes, and that was my cross to bear. Our, our uh, Catholic friends might say, I'm going to give up coffee or social media, and I guess that's just my cross to bear. But this is a, a radical metaphor that Jesus is using here. The Romans had devised one of the most cruel forms of execution of all of history. When Jesus talked about the cross, it was as personal to him as anything else he would speak about. He was going to that cross that he told his followers to take up. Some God-forsaken place by the highway, a man was designated to and hung up like a piece of meat in public and mocked and scorned and suffered through gradual suffocation. The person would rather choke and gasp and die than to push up and get air. That's how excruciating the pain would be. And the picture would have reverberated in the minds of those first century hearers. They looked at his mighty miracles. They looked at his fantastic words that he said. But then he mentions a cross, and I'm sure that there were folks that left that congregation and said the price is too high. The crowd began to swell, and then it began to dwindle. They thought of themselves on that cross beam, on that one-way journey toward death that was inevitable. And I'm sure hearing these terms and conditions, some, if not most of the people, would have gone away. Will you go away too, or will you follow him? There's conditions that must be met. This isn't a sunny Sunday stroll down the avenue. This is a one-way ticket to death. Everyone who will follow Jesus must take up this cross. You also must first deny yourself. And the word deny means to say no to. You must say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've also got to deny yourself. Now, that's one of the most countercultural things I could probably say from this pulpit. Hey, deny yourself. What does our culture say? Uh, protect yourself. Promote yourself. Educate yourself. Comfort yourself. Entertain yourself. Trust yourself. Seek 
yourself. And Jesus comes along and says, deny yourself. Self says, I don't want to be opposed. Self says, I don't like to suffer. I want, to, I want my life to be easy. Self says, I don't want to be shamed. I don't want to be canceled. I don't want to be disapproved. I want people to like, share, and subscribe. I want followers of my own. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must say no to self, and you're no longer in charge here. Now you have a Lord and Savior that you must follow. That means following even to denying yourself and going to a cross. Brother Johnson, I'm not sure how practical the, the cross illustration is in 21st century American Christianity. We haven't seen people executed that way on this side of the planet. And it's been a long time since anybody has ever been crucified on the cross. Jesus is saying that every follower of his must love himself fully enough to say, I'm going to say no to you and I'm going to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ because no price is too high to follow him. If you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer in some degree or, or another. Here's what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 18. If you're there in John, you can look at it. John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Paul affirms that and even expands on it by saying in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is not just something Jesus says in one particular passage. He's calling everyone that will follow to suffer in one degree or another. So let's do away with the thoughts of cool, casual, comfort, comfortable Christianity. That pain-free Christianity that asks little and accomplishes less. Jesus hasn't left that option available to us. Those are the conditions. Do you accept them? Could I, number two, make a case for following Christ? Could I appeal to what Jesus appeals to? Your self-interest. Uh, okay, Jesus, that sounds really, really, really good. Take up a cross and follow him. Um, why should anybody want to follow the Lord? Well, he makes a very compelling case. Look at verse 35, please. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Think of the argument he's making. Hey, do you want to lose your life? Uh, no. Then don't try to save it. Do you want to save your life? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus says, lose your life and lose it for me. Here's the truth. You're losing your life to something. If you'll lose your life to me, that's the only way to really save it. That's a compelling case. You're all losing your life to something. You might as well lose it to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the only way you could save your life. Be absolutely, totally committed to me and my gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that anyone can receive by simple childlike faith and all of their sins can be forgiven. That's good news. If you'll live in such an unashamed life for my sake in the Gospels, really he's talking about the spread, the mission that we all have in this world to get the Gospel here and to spread it all over the globe. If you'll give me decades of disapproval from the world and decades of self-denial and discomfort and a willingness to die, then in return I'll give you millennia of pleasure in a real place called heaven with me. Christ is our life and our gift forevermore. Here's the reality tonight. You can't save your life, so don't try to save it. Lose it for me and the gospel, and you will save it. Earlier, we took a trip back in time. Now let's take a mission trip all together. Imagine you were to take a mission trip with my wife and I, and here's where we're going. We're going to take a trip to North Africa and we've already planned the trip, everything's paid for, let's get on the plane and go. We take the intercontinental flight, we land, we get settled, and then we go out for coffee. We meet a young lady wearing a burqa on her head. 
And it's obvious she has her whole entire life in front of her. Then we start to strike up a conversation, and then you get to share the gospel with her. She's relieved to hear of a God that's not remote or distant or angry like she thinks deity must be. She's relieved to hear that the seven pillars of Islam or working her way to heaven are not the way to heaven and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. She hears that to miss heaven, she hears that to miss hell and gain heaven, she must renounce Muhammad and all of his teachings. She must renounce Allah and she must put her faith in the one true and living God. We get to the part of the gospel conversation where it's time to call on a decision. And you invite her to pray. She says, if I pray that prayer, if I become a follower of Jesus Christ, it's going to cost me everything. It'll cost me my family. It'll cost me my friends. It may even cost me my life. From this day forward, And for decades in the future, I'll live in a daily fear that someone, perhaps from my own family, will try to put me to death for following Jesus Christ. And then she asks you this question. Should I pray? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Is he worth it? How would you respond? I see some of you nodding your heads. Of course. Yes, of course you should pray. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's easy to say in a nice, comfortable auditorium on a Wednesday night here in the capital of Ohio. Yeah, go ahead. Trust Jesus. It's worth it. But what does your life say? Does your life say that Jesus is worth risking everything when you won't even risk a little side eye at work? When you won't even sacrifice anything close to an hour a day to read your Bible and pray to the one that saved you and you're going to be with for the rest of your eternity? Should she tell her family goodbye? Should she sacrifice her entire promising life to pray and receive Jesus Christ? Should we tell her not to fear death and trust the gospel of Jesus Christ When we've claimed to follow Jesus Christ for decades and we haven't even told one other person about the gospel, what does our life say? There are people all over this world who have yet to take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ. Should she take up her cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Should you? Absolutely. Only a fool fool would choose 80 years of human approval and the safety and security in this temporary world rather than 80 billion years of God's approval and eternal pleasure at God's right hand. The only way to really live your life is to deny yourself and take up your cross. Those are the only people that are actually really living their life. I've been told to get a life. And the only way I get a life is if I deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. Here's the thing. People in North Africa, North China, North Korea, they've already, they know what it is to follow the Lord when they're directly opposed. In North Korea right now, if you had any portion of the scripture in your possession, not only could you be arrested, but everybody in your household could be arrested. They know the high price of following the Lord Jesus Christ. People in Ohio who won't leave the comforts of their home on a mild Wednesday in, in July that believe that a virus is only, only uh, transmitted at church gatherings. Well, I, I can't meet at a, a church like that that I might get sick. They're fooling themselves. I wonder if we'll ever be inconvenienced to knock on a door and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. The people who are seeking the approval of man are the ones losing in the long run. They may be saving themselves a little inconvenience and embarrassment here, but they're throwing away their souls and eternity, and it will reveal that they are lost. Jesus says that once in a while, we ought to examine ourselves that we're in the faith. and Maybe some of us should do that today. If our Christianity costs us nothing... Maybe we should ask if we have the genuine article or some 21st century comfortable, cheap alternative. Following Jesus is to be willing to lose your life. 
But to lose your life, Jesus said, is to gain your soul. I think that's a very compelling case, don't you? The last verses of our chapter are going to tell us two areas of conflict very quickly. Number three, let's look at the conflicts. You can expect a battle. And here's where the conflicts are going to come in two different areas. Look at verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain his Gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Firstly, you're going to expect a conflict when it comes to possessions. Really, Read verse 35 and 36, and Jesus is talking about money. He uses financial terms like profit and loss and gain and exchange. He's talking about money here. If you follow me, it's going to affect your bottom line. Don't make a bad trade tonight by pursuing a life of vast wealth instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Scripture says, I've been young and now I'm old and I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. God provides, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But that strikes at the heart of what we believe as a 21st century Christian. We believe that he who dies with the most toys wins. This message that the world preaches, have more stock options, more insurance, more laid up for yourselves, the bigger houses. That's the message from the world. Make this world more comfortable. Have as much as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can. This is the materialism that so many Christians have bought into. Listen to the question of Jesus. Does it profit a man if he gains the whole world for a moment but loses his soul for all of eternity? What would your soul fetch on the open market? How much is your soul worth? Have you priced vegetables lately? Have you priced cosmetic surgery or plastic surgery or even vitamins? Did you know that Amazon will ship you within two days uh, a moisturizer called Hope in a Jar? That's called false advertising right there. Don't make a bad trade. Don't live for this temporary life that we have. God wants us to live for eternity and not something that's going to burn. Now, Jim Elliott said this, and you know the quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Don't trade Jesus for treasure. And here's the second conflict, the praise of men. We like to be affirmed, don't we? We like to be approved. We don't like to be canceled. We, uh, we like to have the thumbs up. We like to have the loves. We like to have the affirmation. Look at verse 38. If you're ashamed of me when I return, by the way, Jesus is coming back. Do you believe Jesus is coming back soon? If the judge is standing at the door, he could be here today, and I wish he would be. I want to be found watching, praying, and working. I want to be engaged in his mission when he finds me, when he comes back. Here's what it is. If you're going to win the acclaim of Jesus, you're going to have shame in this world. If we'll have the acclaim of this world, we're going to win the shame of Jesus. Jesus estimates the modern world by saying, what does he say? It's an adulterous and sinful generation. Do you know what that adulterous and sinful generation did to Jesus? They nailed him to a cross. They crucified him. What do you think this adulterous and sinful generation wants to do with anybody that stands up, stands up for Jesus or shines their light for him? Why are you so worried about their approval? There's a part of us that wants the approval of this world, and that's the part you have to deny. You have to say no to it. The sinful and adulterous generation seems so loud and popular and in power. Seems like they're having all the fun. They have instant gratification. They have everything that they want for now. The part of me that wants approval of this world is the part that I have to deny. Are you ashamed of his gospel? Are you ashamed for your friends and family members and coworkers to know that you belong to him? Do your friends and neighbors and family members and coworkers know that you belong to him? Are you a camouflaged Christian? Are you a rhino Christian? 
redeemed in name only. You come to church, you act like a Christian, you go into the world, and then you act like the world. Are you ashamed to live an out-and-out Christian life? Here's the question from Jesus. Are you willing to receive a temporary shame from a sinful and adulterous people now, or will we endure eternal shame when the Son of Man returns with his angels? To be honored in this world now is to be shamed when Jesus returns. To be shamed by this world now is to be honored when Jesus returns. Whose honor are you living for? There's these two points of conflict follow whether we are true Christians or not. Are you willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ even if it affects your bottom line? Are you willing to follow Jesus Christ even if it affects your approval of men? If the answer is no to either or both of those questions, ask yourself whether you're in the faith or not. There is no pain-free, cross-free way to follow Christ tonight. He was 24 years old when he sat down at a piano, and his life was at a real crossroads. He could continue singing for the gospel and singing in his church, or accept a very lucrative position in New York City at the Radio City Music Hall and sing songs that had nothing to do with Jesus. There was an old poem sitting on that piano that day written by Mrs. Ray Miller that seemed to echo the sentiments of his heart. The man would put music to those words and he would sing that song for the rest of his life. His name was George Beverly Shea, and the song was, I'd Rather Have Jesus. For decades, he traveled with a man named Billy Graham all over the world, calling to 100 million people to lay down everything and follow Jesus, and 2.2 million of them did. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. Yes, I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. That was a man who understood the terms and conditions of following Christ. There's a pop-up screen right now on your life. Do you accept these terms? You can accept or reject these terms. I would invite you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him.